Hello there and welcome to Join News. It's 77 days to election 2020 and you're welcome to News Desk coming to you from our Fun of Us studio at Kokomlimli. We are also live on your digital TV because we are free to air DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 144. My name is Charles Aite. And coming up in this bulletin, Tamale Accra Road risks being flooded as floods in the northern Ghana spill over towards southern sector with many communities in the Savannah region submerged due to continuous heavy downpour. And General Overseer of the Perez Chapel International, Bishop Charles Ajinasari, mounts strong defense of his national transformation agenda, insisting it's not an agenda to change regimes. People from all walks of life, <laughs> mm. you know, and some even had to, some after my second week, some came to me and said, Bishop, you see, you have to beef up your security. <laughs> Bishop, you have to be afraid. Don't sleep in your house when you sleep here today. Yeah. Well, look for another place and go and sleep. And today on our COVID impact series, we tell you how children in Sab Brungu community of the Upper East region are making good use of the over 20 years abandoned library for their studies. And in business beverage firm Casa Preco, optimistic of creating over 300 jobs amid COVID-19 as government's 28 million tax waiver births new factories in Kumasi. We have all these stories coming up and more, including sports. Please stay. Hello once again, you're welcome to the program. Now, today in our series of stories looking at the impacts of COVID-19 on communities, we take you to the Sabrungu in Board in Bogatanga Municipality of the Upper East Region, where a community library started over 20 years ago. Now, it's helping children there to continue their studies in the wake of the closure of schools across the country. Here is a report by our correspondent, Albert Sori. It is a wet afternoon after hours of rain here in Sombrongo, and many would rather stay indoors. But not 11-year-old Selina Anyeta, who needs to catch up on her studies. Five months without school due to the coronavirus pandemic means that Selina must find other ways to keep studying since her parents cannot afford private tuition for her at home. The community library located inside the Sumbrungo Women's Center is the perfect place for Selina and other children to learn without getting distracted. Therefore, not even the rain will stop her from missing today's opportunity to learn. We come to study, the, to learn the things we don't know. And books are there for references. Anything we read and we don't understand, we can refer to other books. And still, if we don't understand, we can ask the librarians and they will help us. The Sombrungo Community Library was set up by the Center for Sustainable Rural Development, a community-based organization started by Rex Asanga, who is now the MPP's parliamentary candidate for the Bolgatanga Central Constituency. It is one of three libraries set up in different communities under the Community Libraries Project, which began in the year 1998 to help improve the reading habits of school children. I had heard of an organization called Friends of African Village Libraries that was into supporting community libraries in Burkina Faso. So I sent him a mail uh, asking that uh, if uh, St. Burkina and uh, Bolka were not very far, if they could extend the same uh, assistance to us. And they sent somebody who came and did a kind of needs assessment of the area. And then they went back and yeah, that's how the community libraries came uh, into being. So after some years we went to Sergo. We moved to Gori Konkua in Bongo district and started an hour. So we're actually currently running three community libraries. Today, the Sombrungo Community Library is not just a place where Selina and her colleagues can come to read. It also employs a librarian and an instructor who together guide the children to discuss their assignments and do group studies. Paul Ayutolia is the coordinator for the community libraries who also volunteers as the instructor. 
because of the coronavirus that's why the numbers are even a little bit lower and then when they come they pass through all the protocols we have a veronica bucket at the entrance where they first of all wash their hands before coming in and then we have sanitizers in the library hall once a while they sanitize for these children, the coronavirus pandemic has put a blot on their academic journey. But at least they can rely on this library until their schools can reopen. We don't go to school because of the coronavirus. And it has affected me in a sense that the things we were supposed to learn at school, we haven't learned them. And when we go back to school, we have to repeat the term that we used to stay at home. I feel sad because the school is locked down and we can't go to school anymore because uh, the coronavirus has spoiled everything. <laughs> and at home I don't have the books to read like I have the books in the library to read. And at the library I have friends that I can ask them something if I don't understand. Rex Asanga says he makes time to come once in a while to interact with the children here in this library because as a parent himself he is concerned about the dangers children could be exposed to due to the closure of schools as a result of the coronavirus pandemic the fact that kids are no longer going to school means that they are on their own at home and their parents are going to work and these kids are left alone at home and i think that this is a place where uh, kids, if they spend a lot of their time here, uh, uh, it will be much more profitable. So I think that this library is really playing that, uh, uh, you know, role of uh, filling in that gap. The Sombrungu Community Library is not the same as school, but for these children, it is a safe haven to keep abreast of their classroom subjects until they can go to school again. Albert, sorry. Choi News, Sombrungu. Now, reports reaching Joy News indicates that the floods in the northern Ghana are gradually spilling over into the southern sector. According to Joy News Kojo Yangson, the Accra Tamer Road risks being heavily flooded among other communities in the Savannah region should there be heavy rains anytime soon. Well, let's cross over live to Kojo Yangson and his team who have been in the north throughout the weekend to provide support for these flood victims. So, uh, Kojo, what can you report from where you are currently? It seems we're having some challenges, you know, hearing what exactly Kojo is saying. Right, could, let's, 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 yeah, you're clear let now. Let me hear you're me better now. now. You, you're loud and clear, Kojo. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, the mood in uh, these four regions up north, the upper east, the northeast, the northern and the savannah region, is a mood of fear. People are very, very concerned that more rain will mean more damage. The flood water is moving further south, so it has already wreaked havoc in the northeast, in the upper east, and the northern regions. It is now moving into the savannah region, where communities like Daboya, like Interesso, and Yape are seeing the rise of the level of the white voter. Now, in Yaku, this is where the greatest danger is, is being anticipated. The water has risen to the level of the legendary, iconic Yaku Bridge. This is a bridge that stands on pillars that are about 30, 40 feet high. The water has risen from the um, river all the way up 30, 40 feet, almost to the level of the road, of the bridge. Now, if we have more rain in the coming days, that bridge will be submerged. Mm. And with it, the road from Accra to Tamale will be cut off. That, that sounds very troubling. That many people in that community are concerned about. Mm. That sounds very troubling. But where have you visited so far? And what kind of support have you been providing? We do know that so far we've had corporate entities like Ecobank support with 50,000 CDs. What else can we you know, say in regards to the support? Right, now, um, this, this campaign, the Up To Us campaign, is being spearheaded by the Super Morning Show and Joy FM as a whole, with great support from Ecobank. Now, we came into several communities in the northern region. We went to a place uh, um, called Ndawuni, where the members of the community have been moved out of their homes into a school. 
So this is now their temporary residence. There is no toilet facility. The rooms are very hot and they are sleeping on the bare floor. So we've realized that there is a need for things like mattresses. There is a need for food because everybody has lost their livelihood with the flood. The fishermen, the farmers, they've lost their farms, they've lost their nets. So they can't feed themselves or their families. So they need food, they need mattresses, they need clothes. I met a woman who has been wearing the same clothes for a week hmm. because she lost everything else. So these are the things that are most needed. There are also communities like Afaire, where uh, the people have been surrounded now by water. The entire community is now an island where people could walk or drive into the community. Now they are cut off from the rest of the world. And they are concerned because there are no boats. They are currently borrowing a fisherman's boat. So when he's working uh, out on the water, they cannot enter or leave the community. So there is a need for aid to come to, 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 um, to them in the form of transportation, whether it's a boat, whether it's some means of getting from their community into the rest of civilization. These are the things that are so badly needed. And all the money being raised by the Up To You campaign uh, with Ecobank is going towards that. So again, we call on people to, to, to come to the aid of these people because uh, if they are waiting for uh, the state to step in, it might be too late. This is virtually a humanitarian crisis there. Tell us about the weather and the rains at the moment in these areas. I've got to tell you, now every time the wind starts to blow a little bit and the color of the sky changes, everybody gets nervous. In the fishing communities, they have actually now designated those who can go out into the water and those who cannot. Because they believe that the weather can change so quickly. If there is an inexperienced person in a boat, they might drown. Okay, so everybody is taking precautions to protect themselves from the potential danger of further rain. I went into the Upper East region yesterday and I spoke to some farmers in Kualibu. Now, they've lost everything. Everything. Now, if you think about it, Charles, farmers usually gain a livelihood once or twice a year when they harvest. They have just lost their harvest. So it's pretty much like somebody uh, who works for a living being told that they have lost their salary for a year. That's the situation they are faced with. A farmer told me that he dreads going home because all he sees around him are bills. His wife and children, they need things that he can now no longer pay for because of the rain. Okay, so these are the things that they are calling for. They are saying that they want the state to bring them corn, beans, rice, oil, things that they can use to survive and feed their children. And it is ironic, Charles, mm. that a corn farmer is asking the government to give him corn. That is how low this flood has sunk him and his colleagues. Indeed. Uh, we do know that NADMO has been trying to help some victims. Have you come across any of their teams uh, on your visit so far? We did not come across NADMO in any of the communities we visited. But we know that they have been to some of them to do feasibility studies. And they say that they are having meetings to determine how they can come and help the people. So uh, these meetings have been going on for over a week now, and the people are still waiting for the help to come. There are some communities where NADMO has been distributing buckets and mattresses. These are in the northeast region. Now, they were not there when we went uh, to visit these communities, but we know they have been there. And they have given some of these supplies, uh, in the mattresses and buckets. The people there are still calling and asking for food, uh, for clothing, and basic things. Uh, especially, most importantly, to those who have been displaced. They want a plan. They want to know the plan for restoring their home. Because they cannot live in classrooms and sleep in tents forever, Charles. Interesting. Let's, let's talk about children and the vulnerable. I mean, the aged and the weak. Kojo, have you seen any... And how are they coping amidst this particular sort of crisis? Charles, they are not doing well at all. In Nawuni, that I, uh, where, where we first visited, we met an elderly lady who had to run from a Well, I say run, but this lady cannot really move very fast. She has a walking stick, and she had to hobble out of her home when the rain was breaking it down around her ears. So the community had to help her. And while she was carrying her grandchild on her back, they helped and ferried her and ushered her into the school. Now, she, at the moment, is weak. She, she, she can't really do much. And she's worried about the fact that she may not get the opportunity to ever return to her home. We met a little girl. Uh, I think she's about six years old, who had not eaten all day because there's nothing to eat. Now, if you think about it, just 20 Ghana feet donation from somebody would make a world of difference to a little child like that. And let's not forget that there are children among the dead. 
There's a three-year-old girl who was washed away when the Bagre Dam spilled in the Upper East region. She went out to play at a friend's house. She tried to make her way home. She didn't make it. She's dead. And she was only three. So the vulnerable, of course, they are the ones who are at highest risk when natural disasters like this happen. And the longer we wait to go to their aid, the more of them we are going to lose. And that society, of course, is always judged by how they treat their most vulnerable. I can imagine. So where are you headed now and how are the roads? Have you been, you know, the kind of roads are you accessing currently? How are they? Well, for the worst of the roads, we really had to cross them with canoes. The roads don't exist anymore. It's water. It's a river that is there in place of the road. At the moment, I'm currently in Tamale. We're about to head to the airport because we are done uh, with our visit. Um, so Tamale is fine. The roads here are absolutely fine. We'll make it very safely to the airport. But there are people in outlying communities who cannot leave their home because the road is just not there anymore. Instead, there's a river. Just before you leave, could you share with me the canoe experience? You know, how interesting or scary was it for you? Yeah. It's strange. When you're in a canoe, it's the most peaceful, serene experience. The boat glides across the water as if there is nothing to disturb you. But when you look around, you realize that those bushes that you see around you are not bushes. They are the tops of trees, very tall trees. But the water has risen to the point where you are now gliding along and you, can, you, have, you have eye contact with the highest leaves on these trees. It is the strangest, most disconcerting experience to be sailing on a road that people used to walk on. But that's reality. Right now, swathes of land have disappeared under currents of water. And the fear is that there is more to come. Koji Yangsen, I'm so grateful that you joined us and you shared with us the entire horrid situation in which most of the residents in the northern region are facing following the spillage of the Bagri Dam. He shall be giving us more stories and more telling revelations on how the residents there are coping. Many thanks once again, Koji Yangsen, for that report. Well, away from that, the Ghana Police Service is this morning embarking on a route march on some streets of Accra to assure the public of its readiness to provide adequate security in the lead up to this year's presidential and parliamentary elections. My colleague Kweku Asante is with, is with them and joins us via Zoom uh, with more. So Kweku, where is the match happening at the moment? So currently we are at La. The police have been going from the police headquarters where they started earlier this morning. They went to circle, they, went, they used the Koju Thompson Road. They've come up all the way to this place. La. As you can see, there is a little bit of traffic flow uh, an easy, an easy traffic flow because the police are ahead of them and there is this kind of blockage that has let the free flow of traffic become a problem for now. And so currently the police are just heading up here towards the lavatory and they are heading back to the police headquarters where they will brief the media. The ITP has joined the procession. They'll be marching through the principal streets of Accra. There were a lot of armed, armed police personnel with their guns, with their rifles, their assault rifles, all their vehicles, and the police have been trying to push a message across that they are very much prepared for the 2020 parliamentary and presidential election. Mm. So uh, the entire exercise is to assure the public. Have you interacted with them? What more can you report on that? Yeah, so we've been interacting with some members of the public. We actually spoke to three women earlier who all said that they actually felt that from just this exercise, they're concerned that the police is well prepared for the upcoming general election. But we also spoke to two men who said that they don't think the police are prepared at all and that the police are actually just going to do the bidding of the government in the upcoming election. Of course, they did not provide any evidence, but that is just what they feel. Those two gentlemen we spoke with said that, in their opinion, they think that the police is going to do the bidding of the government as they've actually seen in previous elections where the police have usually been doing things that favors the government. And so there's mixed reactions. Some of them have been saying that they are very much, they very much think that the police is prepared, police is set enough to be able to protect the citizenry as we all head to the 2020 general polls. But there are also some who have expressed concerns that they don't feel that the police is prepared. They've been saying, for instance, that the police has been handpicking specific situations that they want to deal with and they have not been giving them much confidence going into the general election uh, 7 December.
We're so grateful for Kukua Sanchez that you joined us there. Uh, he's following the trail of the Ghana Police Service as they embark on a march to gain the public's trust as they gear up for the 2020 presidential and parliamentary elections in that regard. You're still watching News Desk uh, with me, Charles IIT. And of course, as you do know, we've had a, an extensive discussion with Kojo Yangsin in the northern region where the Bagri Dam spillage is having a die effect on residents there. Also in the headlines, we have seen for yourselves the various situations that most of the youngsters in the northern region, Savannah, have had to face amid the closure of schools. Let's move on to other stories now where founder of the Perez Chapel, Bishop Charles Ajinasare, says his comments about Ghana's governance system are aimed at towards national transformation. Bishop Ajinasare has been in the news in recent times for criticizing various events in the country, drawing both praise and criticism. Speaking to MFR Power on the lockdown on Joy News Channel, the man of God said it's time to reform some norms about Ghana's political system. I used to do what we call youth explosion. It was all part of a national transformation agenda to try and create a certain awareness for the youth, okay. to educate them, to inform them, to make them build solid character. Now, we've done that for the youth. For seven years, we're going around the country doing that. Now, we think that as a nation, people must, the, 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 the awareness must come. Uh, do, do, for me, irrespective of the successes we have chalked as a nation, there's so much to be done. From your uh, uh, outfit mm -hmm. or joy, uh, I saw this uh, um, video footage where you filmed uh, um, the, the vehicles, gallopers that Rollins That's bought rough. at the tail end of his presidency and then 110 or something, and left them when Kufour came. They didn't use them. Yeah. And as at last year or early this year, those gallopers had been reduced to nothing. Mm. And we had to pay judgment death, a debt of $1 billion to uh, the company. Yeah. OK, Kufour came. He said there was a deficit of housing. And so we needed housing. Affordable he, housing. Affordable housing. He built affordable housing. And Professor Tamils and uh, His Excellency John Mahama came, and those buildings have still not been used. We see John Mahama build schools, build hospitals, build other things, and then our president, Nane Kufuado, comes, and his government says, we won't use it. Now, those monies used in building those things are not their personal monies. It's not from their pocket. It's our national money. Yeah. And meanwhile, then we, we, we've been <laughs> always having a, a budget deficit. Yeah. So we have, to, we have to always borrow to be able to make our budget work. So we go cap in hand to uh, donor countries, collecting money, and we collect the money, and we bring it, and we misuse it. For me, it's a misuse. Mm. Is there not a cause for me to talk about it? Well, Bishop Ajinasari also said he will continue speaking truth to power despite being targeted by critics. We hear people talk about closure of churches because maybe one or two pastors misbehaved. Um, we, 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 we saw during the last NDC government where some pastors spoke and how some of the NDC guys took them on, insulted them. We are seeing the same thing happen now. Mm -hmm. um, in this, I mean, people, when some pastors speak, they would curse them, they would blast them, they would say all kinds of things. I think that we, 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 we must come to a place as a people where we know that as pastors, we, we are also allowed to speak on national issues. Mm -hmm. This is our country. We have nowhere else to go. So if there's something going wrong, we should be able to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And when I talk about it and you disagree with me, state your disagreement. Don't insult me because I won't insult you. 
And so when people begin to insult pastors and go on social media and use all kinds of words, then pastors are being targeted. Mm. And so I would say that pastors are being targeted. Yes. Okay. Well, but do you personally feel targeted? I'm sure you've mentioned that you should oh, insult yes. when... Oh, yes. Mm. Yes, yes. When I started speaking, I mean, people from all walks of life. <laughs> mm. You know, and some even had to, some after my second week, some came to me and said, Bishop, you see, you have to beef up your security. Mm -hmm. Bishop, you have to be afraid. Don't sleep in your house. When you sleep here today, yeah. well, look for another place. And I said, I'm not going to sleep anywhere. I'll sleep in my house. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to beef any security. Have you received any threats? <laughs> oh, people have said things mm. to the extent of even saying that they should close this church down okay. and other churches you know especially charismatic churches and so and those are threats mm -hmm. you know uh -huh. can a man and close down a church that was built that, by god that's what some think they can do um but you see what happens is that when people start saying things for us pastors uh, integrity and credibility matters a lot for other professions you can succeed they normally say that you don't need to have character to deliver mm. for other professions. For our profession, you need character to deliver. If you go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, where it talks about the qualifications of a man of God, it states it there categorically. You can't be immoral, you can't be drunken, you can't quarrel, you can't fight, you can't be misbehaving. So for us, character matters. Mm. So if people will, will, will accuse you without proof, if people can mudsling you like they did, oh, I mean, they, they, they <laughs> mudsling me, they, they, they mudslung me, and, uh, but uh, we are here. Strong words from Bishop Ajina Sari there. Well, the national security operatives have arrested leaders of a group suspected of extorting money from young graduates with the promise of a better life under a shady network marketing scheme. Now, the three young men who were initially arrested for posing as national security operatives as a cover for their recruitment business say that they are rather training young marketers and their network marketing business. About 80 young people have already paid 4,300 Ghana cities each to be initiated into the KillNet scheme. Police sources reveal leaders of the scheme have found ways to regroup after previous arrests. Lava FM Sarasa Sari Donko has more in this report. Are you ready? Yes. Are you ready? Can I be ready? Yes. These young people, numbering about 80, have congregated in this house at Chikrum, close to Fumeswa, with the aim of amassing wealth in the shortest possible time. They've invested 4,000. 300 Ghana cities each in a scheme which promises double dividends. To realize the quick returns on their cash, they need to recruit other people into the deal to also pay the same amount. The kind of product that qualifies you to become part of the company is 4,000 and then above. I paid 4,300 Ghana cities for I joined. I paid 4,300. In 2017, hundreds of youth of northern descent were recruited under a similar deal called Killnet and housed under similar circumstances. It took the Redna Coordinating Council to break their ranks. Today, national security operatives, after a tip-off, leaders were posing as national security officials to recruit people, stormed this premises at Fumesha. We had an information this afternoon that some people are using national security name and be giving people's job, collecting their money and the rest. So in fact, our boss had information and he has us to come and check what is going on. Leaders, however, say they are rather operating under the networking scheme KillNet, the same deal disbanded about three years ago. We represent KillNet in our locality, our region, or our country. Solely means that our products and services are mainly for KillNet. And for that matter, we take our products from them and we get in payment of what commissioned. So on a such issue that we QNET or we IRs of QNET are using QNET as a, I mean, creating job opportunities or as a so of um, under national security is simply on a false accusation. We, we are not under, um, what do you call it, as a national security. 
nor are we workers of Kyunet, but then we are all independent, independent representatives of Kyunet. They have since been handed over to the regional police command for further investigations. Reporting for Joy News, Erastus Asaridonko, Kumase. And you're still watching News Desk with me, Charles Aite. Now, senior law lecturer Dr. Enes Ozudapa is advising government to establish a presidential commission of inquiry into medical negligence in Ghana. As head of the commercial law department, Dr. Dapa believes that such an inquiry will embolden victims to report incidents and enable the states to acquire data that will help address healthcare delivery issues in the country. His comments are part of his views shared on the subject of medical negligence which has recently witnessed an upscale. Here are excerpts of his interview on COVID and the law with Samson Ladi Ayanini. One crucial thing we need to have before we can make any meaningful progress in our country is that just as we've had various commissions of inquiry or public inquiries into various matters, including political matters, sports, election disputes and all that, I think that one important area which affects all of us as human beings, because so long as we are alive, we are going to become patient at one point or the another. And for that matter, whatever uh, pertains to healthcare and uh, improving the quality of healthcare and non so, providing uh, appropriate uh, grievance, uh, 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 a redress, redress mechanism should mm. be of interest to all of us. Mm. So, therefore, let's get an opportunity uh, in which patients will feel free come out and tell their stories so that we get documented uh, some of the bad experiences, mishaps and errors which go on in our various uh, health facilities, teaching hospitals, uh, other hospitals, primary care centers and so on and so forth. Now when we document this and when uh, uh, the media through assistance of uh, uh, Joy News and uh, something you give the necessary publicity for the whole country to follow it, just as we followed the various uh, presidential commission of inquiry into sports, into uh, electoral related the violences, violences and all that. All of us will become aware that when you talk about medical negligence, medical malpractice, it's not an abstract thing. It is something which is happening uh, all along. And again, our healthcare professionals themselves, uh, sitting back and listening to some of the stories, we begin to do self-introspection and ask, what could we have done to minimize, if not even completely eliminate uh, this uh, unfortunate uh, incident? With 77 days to election 2020, Member of Parliament for Ashaman constituency, NS Nogbe, has charged NDC supporters to police activities of the Electoral Commission ahead of the December polls. Now, the MP alleges that the Commission is seeking to suppress votes in NDC's stronghold, arguing that many electorates who cannot trace their names in the voter register are within areas known to vote for the NDC. There has been claims and counterclaims between the EC and the MP who told the media on Friday that he could not find his name on the voters' register. My colleague Kwesi Parker Wilson has more in this report. The Ashaman MP, NX Nogbe, first raised an alarm when he visited Celestia polling station at Ashaman and discovered his name was not captured in the provisional register. The EC, in a quick response, issued a statement to dismiss the MP's claims that he could not find his name. Regarding the allegation by the Ashiaman MP to the fact that his name has been deleted from the voters' register, let me state emphatically that it is false. The na his name has not been deleted nor expunged from the voters' register. Secondly, has been alleged that the names of 21,000 registered voters have been deleted from the voters' register. That again is false, and we have evidence to that effect. Joy News visited the polling center to verify the claims. On Friday, when you came here, people started coming, and then their names were not in the register. So we're told to be capturing their names on this paper over here. You write their name, they are uh, ID number and then their telephone number. So when the MP also came, truly the name was not on the register, the, the first one given to us. So his name was, was also captured. 
the ID number and, 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 and the telephone number. And so you can see a whole lot of names that we've written over here whose names are not on the register. That's the one that we started with on Friday. Mm. Yes. So about how many people uh, have you okay, captured so far about, that their names are not on the register? We were able to write about 135 before the evening. And then the, that same evening, when I got to the office, I saw that they brought a new register. Mm. So we checked on the office and I saw his name in the register. Before even before it was brought here, I myself I saw it before it was brought here. But when he came, the name was missing. So on Friday, his name was not yes, on the register. You, you can see the that. exhibition register. Yes, his name was not yes, you can see that this one is up to page 22. Mm. Page 22. Despite an apparent resolution of these anomalies, the NP insists about 7,000 other names are still missing from the register. He has been calling on NDC supporters to be vigilant with activities of the Electoral Commission from now to the polls in December. He is of the firm belief that the country's election regulator intends to suppress votes in the NDC strongholds. All, ND, all NDC strongholds. All NDC strongholds. Mo okay, let me say most of the NDC strongholds, these things are happening. Um, parts of water region is happening. Tamale South is a stronghold of NDC. Bunkatama is one of the strongholds of the NDC. And Ashiaman. And several other areas that these things are happening. You, you, you can realize the mischief behind uh, the act. Because they have lost credibility. So the Electoral Commission must be watched carefully, must be watched critically. And must be policed critically, boot for boot, toe for toe. We must check them. We must not allow them any space to do what, what pleases them, not at all. We must always make sure that we open our eyes to watch them critically. Now, the flag bearer of the NDC, John Dramani Mahama, has extended his support and tour of the Bono East region by a day. It is not clear why the campaign tour, originally scheduled to last for three days, has been extended. But Mr. Mahama, who is expected to cover the entire region, has, as of Sunday afternoon, visited nine out of the 11 constituencies. He's been addressing a derby of chiefs and people of Bonomanto in the Nkranza North constituency and also engaging others in the Nkranza South constituency. <laughs> I have so many things that I have done. I have done a lot of things. I have done a lot I have done a I have Moving on from politics to the National Science and Maths Quiz, and only three girls' schools won contests out of the nearly 20 in the National Science and Maths Quiz preliminaries in the Northern Zone, Bono, Ahafo, and Ashanti regions. Our Lady of Mount Carmel SHS, St. Monica's SHS, and Northrick Dam Girls SHS will join some 37 preliminary stage winners, as well as 14 runners up through the 1 8th stage. As expectations soar ahead of the next level, join us as PSA Nanayao Safo serves you with a recap of the prelims highlights in the following report. This is a very super Maracunda Bonkakas <laughs> quiz we are going to excite today. But to my perception, I think we are bringing winning. We are having a very high morale that today we are going to do miracles. We are winning contest today. Victory! All schools arrived with expectations of triumph. For 10 out of 16 participating in the Northern Zone preliminaries, the contest ended in defeat and tears. This included the only girls' school in the region with a shot at the 1 8 stage, Tamale Girls SHS. I don't think we're failing, or even right now, we don't feel any pressure as we competed with the guys. <laughs> just that <laughs> I think we could have done better. I think the problem was just the second round, as the name suggests, speed race. Unfortunately, on our part, we're not fast enough 
to compete. Feeling so sad. It's not easy to come all along this while then coming to lose it to a, another school is very uh, tragic. A, a lot of things went wrong. Uh, for me, the, like uh, based on our communication, there was some poor uh, connection between the with the contestants. So the connection, yeah, what does that mean? The communication was very poor, so we could not we could not uh, extract the data. Mm, I'm feeling so bitter. Zabzugu Senior High School, St. Francis Xavier Junior Seminary, St. Charles Minor Seminary, Bogatanga SHS, Navrungo SHS, and the Northern School of Business grabbed the titles of various contests, securing their places in the 1 8 stage of the competition. Yes, I'm the head of the science department. Mm -hmm. My name is Samuel Yatu Albin. And then the, these are my boys and then my colleague teacher, Emmanuel, we've been preparing them. And uh, there is a verse in our, our, our anthem that we were crippled, but we are now strong like Sundiata. Continue to rise up to the sky. And we've been there before. We've, we've gone up to the, the one eighth stage. This time we are targeting the finals. And by God's grace, we'll get there. <laughs> Being on that stage is really hell. When, <laughs> especially the first round, when, we, when, when we're just like, hell, hell, yeah. hell indeed. Wow. But <laughs> we have to come together, you know, it's just a simple prayer. Just, you ask God to just, just give you the strength and the confidence. And then when the questions were coming, we calm down and then we take it up. Yeah. The Blue Zone saw a turn of luck for the girls' schools as both Our Lady of Mount Carmel SHS and Notre Dame girls won their slots. The Lord that has given us the strength to reach here and win the contest will surely help us to make it by the grace of God. It's just by the favor and grace of God that we've won this contest. But for the defeated schools there, another factor, aside from grace and hard work, contributed to their losses. Due to the coronavirus, we couldn't prepare enough. Bukum SHS, Our Lady of Mount Carmel Girls SHS, Notre Dame Girls SHS, Techiman SHS and Sunyani SHS are winners of the preliminary stage contest, sailing through to the 1-8 stage from the zone. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. It may have taken six contests, but the Ashanti Zone had its first girls' school, qualifying to the 1-8 stage through St. Monica's SHS. They are joined by Fuakubi and Pem girls, who lost to St. Hubert Seminary SHS in the fourth contest, yet make it to the next stage as part of 14 best runners up. Also qualifying from the same zone are Agogo State College. We knew from the start that we are going to win it because we have been training for, the, for a very long time to win the trophy, not this. So this was just a form of results for us. And Anglican Senior High School Kumasi. Last year, we met Opokuwari. Uh, at the end of the contest, they, led, they beat us by one point. So we went home and by the grace of God, through preparation and guidance by our coordinators and also the support from our old students, they, um, we have built ourselves, they have built us and through their instructions, when we apply this on stage, it worked for us. Can a girl's school win the ultimate crown this year? We will know in the next few days. PSC and Nile Safo, join us. And we wish the contestants all the best in this battle of minds. Well, still to come in business, beverage firm Casa Preco optimistic of creating over 300 jobs amid COVID-19 as government's 28 million tax waiver bets new factory in Kumasi. We are back with more on this shortly. Do stay. And it's now time for business. Beverage firm Casa Perco is optimistic of creating over 300 jobs amid COVID-19 as government's $28 million tax waiver bets new factory in Kumase. Now, the managing director, Rachel Eje, says that government's tax waiver machinery, equipment and raw materials has eased the financial burden of the company as it established a new factory at Tanoso in Kumase under the One District, One Factory initiative. He spoke to Joy Business. 
One district, one factory program that the government put in place um, that encouraged us to put up this factory here in Tanoso. Um, we certainly believe that without the government support, um, entrepreneurs and the private industry cannot grow um, as fast as um, we want to. Um, so with the incentives, I believe that it has really helped us a lot um, to build this factory. We got incentives um, to waive our duties for the machines, um, machines worth over $10 million. Um, we got a lot of duties as well for the raw materials. Total duties um, waiver and taxes that we got was about $28 million for five years. Um, and we believe that this certainly would help the factory break even faster. And once we break even, um, we are certainly going to expand and more. Um, some of the other incentives that we are still working on um, with the government, and we believe that it will come to fruition. It's some of the some of the um, the government, the one D one one district is also promising to pay um, part of the interest from the loans that we've um, used for this um, factory. Um, so we got a loan of about twenty five million um, dollars from Stambik. Um, and part of the interest, the government is also willing to support, pay the interest. And all these are certainly good for, for not only the company, but also for consumers. Um, certainly makes the product more, much more cheaper for the consumers to buy. For this factory here in Tano, so we are looking at employing um, direct employment, about 300 people from engineering, chemistry, salespeople, warehousing drivers um, but as well along the supply chain um, the indirect employment is going to be about 3,000 um, employ employees we are looking at our distributors even the hawkers selling our products our suppliers um, that we work with um, so we are going to have close to 50 distributors in Ashanti region alone northern region are also going to have more um, and you know they are all going to employ people to sell the product, give the product legs. Um, so it certainly gives a wide range of um, distribution. Um, we also look forward to working with um, tech. Um, we also look forward to working with tech to bring in engineers or students here to also learn from the factory over here. Well, name any tourist attraction site in Ghana and definitely the Volta region comes to mind. Unfortunately, the tourism potential of this region is lean. Domestic tourism isn't really tapped into due to poor marketing skills. To this end, stakeholders within the Volta region are pushing for domestic tourism there through stronger marketing skills. Fred Duho has more in this report. Travelling for about 40 minutes, we made our first stop at the Adakru Mountain. Ceci Moses has lived in this community for over 50 years. He tells me people come to hike on the mountain for fun but pay nothing. I'm over now. After catching the beautiful sights and landscape, we went through Ho to Tafi Atome. We have been welcomed by one of the monkeys here at the Tafi Atome Monkey Sanctuary. The manager of the Monkey Sanctuary, Francis Akwe, was of the firm belief that Volta region stands to gain from tourism than any other natural resources. Um, you know, Volta region has gotten, you know, uh, uh, the best, if I would, uh, the best natural um, attractions, potentials that we can turn into tourism. You know, um, yes, tourism is benefit. I mean, uh, Volta region benefits a lot from tourism. Uh, because uh, most of the tourists that visit Ghana, they like to visit uh, Volta region. We should target cleanliness. And when we target cleanliness, after targeting cleanliness, then they look at the potentials in each area so that they will gather them together and then start to sell the place out. The Volta Regional Director of the Ghana Tourism Authority, Alexander Inketia, who superintends over the industry, was optimistic as restrictions ease. We are trying to enhance the capacity of the various tourist sites and also of the industry as a whole, because you can say the industry is growing. After touring almost three places earlier in the day, we are finally at the Willy Waterfalls. 
Surprisingly, a number of cars are parked here. Looks like business activity is bouncing back after the impact of COVID-19. Some cars, I can see boldly written on them, KNUSD, indicating that they are coming from uh, Kumasi. The managers of the Vli Waterfalls say their numbers are gradually picking up. Emmanuel Kojo Blokpo is the senior tour guide. We tell them that this is the highest waterfall in West Africa. And that there are a lot of things to see. Even going there alone, you cross over nine bridges to get there. Then when you get to the top, we have a lot of fruit bats, fruit eating bats or straw colored bats. So I mean, very interesting. And when it's three o'clock, as the sun goes down, you see the rainbow also coming up. And uh, people, some of them get scared, but uh, we call the, <laughs> the attention that it is only nature. I finally made it to the Fli Waterfalls. This is a very beautiful sight to behold. We have come to Keta, the fourth prison team. We understand it's among the four major forts built by the Danish. Now, this is the dungeon of no return. We understand this particular room is for the hardened slaves. I mean, the 12 ones. This was among the four major Danish structure in the eastern section of Ghana. Where we are now, this one of the room, the dungeon, where they kept the, the hardened slaves at that time. And this, are, as you can see, these are some of the chains where the slaves were chained to. A neck in the leg of the slaves. Fred Hill's reports there end in business. But just before we leave, illegal mining has survived in Ghana for decades and remains an albatross that the country continues to battle with. Now, the illegal venture continues to have dark cascading effects on the country's forest reserves and water bodies. Water sources have been heavily polluted with dangerous chemicals likely like mercury and cyanide through the activities of illegal miners affecting aquaculture, the ecosystem and human lives in general. Latif Idris in our latest hotline documentary, Galamse, winning some battles and losing the war, examines how the state-sponsored war against illegal mining has fared as the illegal miners continue to outwit authorities to pilot the harm, the environment making nonsense of the country's mining laws. Natural Resources Minister and his deputy are flying to the disaster zone to get first-hand information as to why these Galamseyas defied directed to undertake the operations that led to the untimely death of the 16. The small-scale mining sector in Ghana is central to the country's success story in the global gold production rankings. According to the Natural Resources Governance Institute, the sector in 2018 alone contributed some 2.3 billion Ghana cities, representing 5% of government's revenue. The idea of ending the illegal mining menace in recent times was started by former President John Dramani Mahama. The approach was no different from the use of Vanguard. As I took frontline position to report about this operation by a joint police co military task force in the eastern region town of Asamama. We've had illegal mining activity taking place over the years. As you can hear, that is a town of Gangtok. Gangtok. Fight by the police. And yeah. we have the young men who are trying to counter the activities of the police here. Right. I have one such gentleman here with me and this fellow is telling me right. what he makes of the situation. Yeah, no, it's getting chaos. We have to run for our lives now. 
the current administration's attempts to end the menace, plenty on the line to fight and win the war against illegal mining. Perhaps this is the first time I'll be saying it in public. I am prepared to put my presidency on the line on this matter. Nothing have I seen under this government, under the presidency of Nana Adudankwa Akufuado, that tells me that he's willing to put his job on the line. And you may not want to miss this jaw-dropping documentary which airs tonight on this channel at 8 p.m. after Joy News Prime. Well, that's it by way of News Desk with me, Charles Aite. For me and the rest of the team, many thanks for watching.